All right. Uh, turn in your Bible to the book of Revelation, if you would, if you have a Bible with you. King James, hopefully. Forgive me, i got to use my glasses when I'm reading my Bible here because I'm getting old. So uh, we're in Revelation chapter 6, and uh, Brother Tom Black's going to be preaching on the end times on Sunday night. And um, I'm going to preach, just, I'm just going to start off with a little bit about the end times as an introduction to what I'm going to be talking about tonight. So uh, we're just going to read the first few verses here in Revelation chapter 6, if you'll follow along with me. Chapter 6, verse 1, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts, saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth to conquer and uh, to conquering and to conquer. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast, beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, that they should kill one another, and there, should, uh, there was given unto him a great sword. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard the voice, excuse me, and I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts saying, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. And when he had opened up the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And his name that sat on him was Death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto him over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. Um, so that's from the book of Revelation. That's talking about uh, the end times. And, uh, you know, as Pastor Tommy has taught us before, the, you know, the, uh, the last period of the end times is known as Daniel's 70th week. And that's a week of years, meaning seven years. And um, now that's kind of separated into two sections. You've got the first half of that seven-year period. Then you've got the last half of that seven-year period. Now the first half is about approximately three and a half years long. Okay, and that three and a half year period is known as the tribulation period. Okay, now formerly before we all studied our Bibles and found out the truth on this matter, we thought the whole seven years was the tribulation period. But no, the Bible clearly states that, that the tribulation period is just the first three and a half years, okay? Now, so what's going to happen is during that final seven years, we're going to have three and a half years of tribulation. And mostly, that's also called the time of Jacob's trouble, okay? Jacob meaning uh, Israel, and, and that'll be trouble for us as believers because we're part of Israel. Okay, so that's going to be a three and a half year period where certain things happen. And we read in the book of Revelation about how certain things are going to happen during that time. And if you look at verse, uh, there's three things that I want you to notice. In verse 4, uh, it says that, uh, and there went out another horse that was red, and power was given unto him thereon to what? Take peace from the earth. That's the first thing I want you to notice. Take peace from the earth. In other words, if there's no peace, what, what is there? Somebody help me here. War, yeah, okay, see, this, ain't, this isn't difficult, okay, <laughs> all right, yeah, if there's not peace, there's war, okay, so the first thing I want you to know, during this three and a half year period, there's going to be war, right, okay, second, in verse six, look down there, uh, and I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts saying, a measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, now, I don't, I'm not a Bible scholar or anything, but what they say is that roughly, uh, in the Bible, a penny was approximately one day's wa wages, okay? Now, to us, that's nothing. A penny's nothing. But back then, one penny was approximate, equal to one day's wages. So what they're saying here is that there's going to be a famine or a problem with the food supply in so much that it's going to cost you everything you made that day just to buy food. You won't have anything left for anything else. Okay, it's going to be a famine. Okay, so that's the second thing I want you to notice. There's going to be starvation or a famine or a problem with the food supply. Okay, now that's the second thing war, famine, and then three, look at number eight, verse eight. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was death, and hell was followed with him, and power was given unto him, unto them, over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. So that's talking about a large section of the population. I don't know whether it's talking about numerical population, one quarter of the people, or it's just talking about a quarter of the earth 
happening, but nonetheless, a lot of people are going to die, okay? And that's a death of one quarter of the world, okay? Whether that's in a physical aspect or it's the population-wise, I don't know, but it's a lot of people are going to die during this period. So the three, three things you need to notice about this three-and-a-half-year period is that we're going to have... We're going to have war, and as a result of war, we're going to have famine, a problem with the food supply, and then number three, we're going to have a lot of people dying, okay? Now, that's bad news, okay? Don't get me wrong. This is, this is probably the worst time you will ever have, okay, as a Christian especially, okay? Now, so that seven-year period, we have three and a half years. Now, that's the first part, the tribulation. The second part is a part that we will not experience because the rapture happens before that and takes us out of here. But the second half of that seven-year period, three and a half years approximately, is known as the wrath of God period. That's where God is pouring out his wrath on the unbelievers, those who have not accepted Christ as their Savior, okay? So we got three and a half years. We will be here and we'll be persecuted and we'll be, uh, we'll be uh, you know, uh, It'll be a time of trouble for us. The Antichrist will actually make war against the saints, according to the Bible. Okay, And now, that's a very bad time. There's going to be war, there's going to be famine, and there's going to be a lot of deaths. Okay, Now, approximately in the middle of that section, something's going to happen, and that's the Antichrist is going to enter into the temple. Now, some people think that's the actual mark of the beast, whether he enters into a physical temple in Israel, in Jerusalem. We don't know for sure, necessarily. Or maybe it's both. I don't know. But what's called the abomination of desolation is going to occur Okay, at that time. After that three and a half year tribulation period, the sun and moon, uh, well, so I'll get ahead of myself. Okay, so that, that there's an approximate period of about 75 days, if you add all the numbers together. After the three and a half year period, you've got a little bit right in the middle called the Great Tribulation. And that's about 75 days, according to the Bible. Okay, Now that's the period where the Antichrist really goes after the believers. And that's where they will put many, many people to death for, for if they do not take the mark of the beast. They'll behead a lot of people. Okay, so that's that 75-day period. And the Bible says if the day, those days weren't shortened, that there would be nobody left on earth because everyone, every one of us would get killed during that time. Okay, so, the, so it's cut short. What happens is at that time, after that 75-day period, period, God comes down and, 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 and we meet him in the air. That's the rapture, the resurrection, okay? the, first, the, the resurrection of the saved. Okay? The dead in Christ rise first. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's the rapture. Got it? Okay, so it's real simple. Three and a half years, bad times. 75 days, really bad times. The great tribulation. This is all known as tribulation. Don't, you know. We even go through a little bit of tribulation here now, but this is the great, this is, this is a lot of tribulation, and this 75 day period is the great tribulation. And then we're raptured out of here, and after we're out of here, all the saved people are gone from earth, and God deals with the unsaved in what's called the wrath of God period, the remaining three and a half years of that whole seven year period, okay? There you got it. Now, that's basically the end times in a nutshell, okay? <laughs> that's, that's the, that's the, that's the uh, simplistic version, okay? Now, uh, I want to talk to you about what's going on during that tribulation period and, and why it's important for us to prepare for that, okay? What can we do, okay? What do we do? Well, hey, there's going to be a war. There's going to be famine. There's going to be people dying. We need to prepare for that. You say, is that going to happen in my lifetime? I don't know. It might. It might not. But one thing's for sure, it is going to happen. And you know what? We need to prepare as if it were going to happen in our lifetime. Because the preparation that prepares us for being ready for the tribulation period and the times that occur then will help us in our Christian life anyway, even if the tribulation doesn't come, okay? So, in our lifetime, okay? Now, it will come, but not in our lifetime, or maybe it will come in our lifetime. We don't know. Now, what's, you know, I'm, I'm, you ever, how many of you have heard the term prepper? before, a prepper, P-R-E-P-P-R. -P 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 what, what does the word prepper mean? Somebody give me a quick definition, anybody. You're getting prepared. You're getting prepared? What else? What's a prepper? What's the world say a prepper is? Stock and food and weapons. Stock and food and weapons, yeah, yeah. Okay, hey, I looked it up. Here, here's, the, here's what Google says it is. The definition of a prepper is a person that believes in a catastrophic disaster or emergency is likely to occur in the future, and they make active preparations for it, typically by 
stockpiling food, ammunition, and other supplies, just like you said. Okay, so even Google agrees with you, brother. <laughs> All right. So that's what a prepper is. And, and, you know, I don't know. You know, I think we need to become tribulation preppers. We, you know, we need to prepare for a worldwide war. We need to prepare for a famine. We need to prepare when people get killed. Now, we know what's going to happen, don't we? The Bible tells us what's going to happen. You know, how many heard of this show, the, the Doomsday Preppers? You ever heard of that show, that TV show? I, I think we watched a couple of episodes from it, but they got all kinds of, you know, they got all kinds of possibilities on all these people believe how the world's going to end and they, how there are different ways to prepare. And you got people that are preparing for financial collapse, uh, electrical grid failure, global pandemics, civic unrest, nuclear war, an EMP attack, Yellowstone supervolcano blowing up, a huge comet hitting the earth. All kinds of different people are preparing for different scenarios in that t television show. All right? Well, you know what? They don't know what's going to happen. They're preparing for different things. Some people are preparing for some of these things on this list that I looked up on the Internet. Some of them are preparing for something different. But they're all preparing for something. And you know what? We are better than they because they, are, they don't know for sure what's going to happen. We do. You know why? We got the Word of God to tell us what's going to happen. Now, okay, well, we know what's going to happen. War, famine, and death, right? In the tribulation period. We're going to be here for it if we don't die first, okay? Or if we don't, you know, if, you know, or if it's, you know, not put off too many more years. I personally think we're going to see it in our lifetime. Things are lining up for this end times period, okay? Now, what, would you, what should we do? There's going to be a war. Well, should we stock up on guns and ammo? I don't know. Brother Pete would probably say, amen, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm all for that, you know. I mean, uh, hey, guns, guns are not bad, despite what the you know, liberals want to tell you. Okay. Well, there's going to be a famine. Okay, what do we do? Do we stock up on food? Okay. Do we stock up on water and food and supplies like that? I don't know. You know, maybe we go out and buy, you know, 15 cases of beans or whatever, and you know, or whatever people buy for that sort of thing. You know, maybe... Maybe uh, we need to can tomatoes <laughs> and uh, eggplant even, you know, stuff like that. I, I heard you were, <laughs> Miss Lori was doing that. You know, I don't think she's planning for doomsday or anything like that. She just, she just wants to feed her family. Your basement looks like it. Your basement looks like it. Amen, brother. I, yeah, amen. Okay. Nothing wrong with stuff like that. But hey, that's all physical preparation, isn't it? Okay, you're preparing for something that you know you're going to, you know, you're probably preparing, Miss Lori and Steve, and you're preparing for, to have food in the wintertime. You know, nothing wrong with that. Absolutely makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, if you know something's going to happen, shouldn't you prepare? Ah, good stuff, water. All right. Well, hey, sometimes we need to do those physical things to prepare, right? But more important, during the tribulation period, during that three and a half year period leading up to the rapture, we need to be spiritual preppers. We need to be tribulation preppers, but spiritual tribulation preppers as well. Okay, we can do all those physical things. Don't you know? Nothing wrong with that. Okay, you know the word prepare or preparation appears in the Bible over ninety times. So God thinks the word prepare or pre preparation is important. God Himself prepared. Okay, God was a prepper. All right. Psalm 103 says, The Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom ruleth over all. John 14, 2, In my Father's house are many mansions, and I go to prepare... Oh, whoops, I'm sorry. In my Father's house are many mansions, and if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to what? Prepare a place for you. God is a prepper. He prepares things, okay? 1 Corinthians 2, 9, I hath not seen, nor ear have heard. Neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for him, for them that love him. God prepares. Okay. You want to be more like God? Okay. Let's, let's get on board. Let's prepare just like God does. If you, if you know something's coming and you know that something needs to be done when that thing comes, you should prepare, right? Oh, my microphone just fell off. Hold on a second. Sorry about that. So we should prepare. God himself prepares. Okay, now, God tells us in the Bible to prepare as well, okay? 1 Samuel says this, prepare your hearts unto the Lord. Prepare your hearts. God wants you to prepare your heart. He commands you to prepare your hearts. In Ezekiel 38, it says, be thou prepared and prepare thyself. 
thou and all thy company that are assembled with thee. God uses the word preparation or prepare all throughout the Bible. Okay, it's not something that we should shy away from. It's not something that we should be, uh, you know, afraid of being called a paranoid kook for doing. Okay, you have to prepare if you know something's going to happen that you need to prepare for. Hey, what about Noah? Was, there, was Noah a prepper? I think so. Um, Hebrews 7, 7 uh, I'm sorry, 11, 7 says, By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not yet as uh, not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, and by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Noah prepared. And you know what? I'm sure glad he did. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here right now. Okay? Noah prepared. But he prepared because God told him to. Preparation is important to God. What about Joseph? Here's another example. Okay? Didn't Joseph prepare set for seven years of famine? in Egypt, and he advised Pharaoh to stock up food? He did. And he stocked up food for Egypt, and also his, his brethren were saved as a result of that. And they have, the famine that came, they were prepared physically. So hey, God prepares, people in the Bible prepares, God told us to prepare, God wants us to prepare also. All right? Hey, turn to Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11. And I want to show you one more section in the Bible here. And I promise to get you out of here at least by 11.15 tonight, so don't worry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. So, uh, now nah, we'll get out. Well, you know, I'm, I'm shooting for 8 o'clock. I really am. So, but, but if you all turn to Daniel chapter 11, verse 28, and we've got some verses to read in here. But I want to read some things to you. Now, this is talking about the end times also, okay? And it's talking about the Antichrist in verse 28, Daniel 11, 28. 28. And it says, and then shall he, referring to the Antichrist, then shall he return into his own land with great riches, and his heart shall be against the holy covenant, and he shall do, what's that next word? Exploits. exploits. He shall do exploits and return to his own land. What's an exploit? Somebody give me a quick definition of an exploit. Anybody know? Yeah. Take advantage of, right? Okay, well, uh, here, I looked up in Webster's, and, and you're right. Uh, so it's you got two kind of different definitions. One's a good part, and one's a kind of a bad definition, okay? The good definition is a deed or act, especially a heroic act or a deed of renown, an adventurous or noble achievement. It can also mean, now that's the good part, but it can also mean to take advantage of in a negative way. Like, uh, you know, some rich guy exploited poor people or whatever. You know, or, or, or somebody took advantage of a situation where they ex exploited somebody. Okay, that's a negative thing. But it can also be a positive thing also. Hey, you know what it says here in, in, in verse 28? It says the Antichrist shall do exploits. He will, you, well, let, let me ask you, do you think that's a good thing or a bad thing? Bad, bad yeah. Okay, so he's going to do the exploits by the definition of the bad exploit, he's going to take advantage of people. He's going to take advantage of a situation for evil purposes. Now, Daniel 11, and then going on to verse 31, talks about that abomination of desolation that I referred to earlier. And it says in verse 31, starting in uh, Daniel 11, 31, it says, And arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate, and such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries, the Antichrist. But the people that do know their gods shall be strong and do what? Exploits. The people that know their uh, that know their God shall be strong and do exploits, and they that understand among the people shall instruct many. They shall fall by the sword, uh, and they. I'm sorry. Yet they shall fall by the sword and by flame and by captivity and by spoil many days. Now when they shall fall, they shall be helping with little help, but many shall cleave to them with flatteries, and some of them of understanding shall fall to try them, and to purge, and to make them white, even unto the end, time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed. Hey, look back at verse 32. The people that know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Now, the Antichrist during this time of tribulation is going to do exploits. He's going to take advantage of the troublous times, right? 
Okay, hey, we as Christians also need to take advantage of the troublous times, the time of Jacob's trouble, the tribulation period. We need to take advantage of it, okay? It brings opportunities. Troublous times bring opportunities for both good and evil, okay? And the question is, what are you going to do, good or evil during that time? Well, Christians, we should be obviously be doing good because the Antichrist is definitely not going to be doing good. He's going to be doing bad exploits. We need to do good exploits, okay? Now, hey, you know, remember uh, Rahm Emanuel? Remember that guy? Mayor of Chicago? Used to be on the uh, Obama administration's team. I don't, what was his position, Eric? Do you remember? I can't remember either. But but he, he made a statement, and you'll, you'll recognize that he said, we you never want a serious crisis to go to waste. You never want a serious crisis to go to waste. Okay? Well, you, Ronald Reagan, hey, he was a Jew, by the way. Hmm. Gee, interesting, isn't it? Okay, never want a serious crisis to go to waste. In other words, when something bad happens, Rahm Emanuel says we need to take advantage of it and make new laws. And that's exactly what happened. Hey, did you know 9-11 empowered the new world order, the one world government people. It empowered them. It gave them legitimacy. It gave them an opportunity to do evil exploits because it was a time of trouble. Do you remember back in 9-11, those of you, not you young people, but the old people, you remember that day? You remember what happened? You remember afterwards how people were like, oh my goodness, what in the world is going on? Is this like the start of the end of the world? People were scared. They didn't know what was going on. They were afraid. And you know what? As a result of 9-11 and people getting scared of what happened at the Pentagon and the, and the towers falling in, in New York City, as a result of that, people actually got a little bit more, more religious, so to speak. They, they went into the church house to get answers. They wanted answers. They didn't know what was going on. Hey, what's going on? All over. You'd see even taverns with signs on it said, God bless America in a tavern. Okay? It... What happens in bad times is it gives us an opportunity. It shakes people up a little bit, okay? Sometimes people need to get shaken up. And God can use a tragic event to shake people up and bring people closer to him. That happened in 9-11. Hey, you know what? 9-11 not only empowered people to try to, get to, to turn to God a little bit more, I wish they would have done it more. They kind of forgot about it after about a year. Everyone, yeah, 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 whatever. It wasn't any big thing then. But during the time it was happening and the few days afterwards, people were shaken up. Okay? Hey, 9-11 also empowered these New World Order people, these One World Government people, the ones that support a One World Religion, a One World Economic System, and a One World Government. They took advantage. They wanted their exploits. Rahm Emanuel, don't let a good crisis go to waste. So what did they do? Hey, you know what? They already had a plan, those people. They already had made preparations, the New World Order people. They already had new policies in the wings, waiting, ready to go, written up in advance that they implemented immediately after 9-11. You know the Patriot Act, the USA Patriot Act? All that stuff that basically gave the, gave the government the power and the authority and the legal structure to invade your privacy and do just about anything they want in the name of national security, right? That Patriot Act was passed within days of 9-11, within days, okay? They had it all written up and ready to go prior to this. They, you know what? Those people were prepared. They were prepared. They were ready to do exploits. They were just waiting for an opportunity. They were just waiting. They didn't want a serious crisis to go to waste. Some people believe that they even created part of that prep crisis so that they could implement some of these policies that they wanted to take freedoms away from Americans and things like that, okay? They had a plan, they were prepared, and they had policies ready to go. Hey, the Antichrist is going to do exploits during the tribulation for evil. Christians need to do exploits as well during that time period. Just like the evil one world government people, they have a plan, and we need a plan. We need to prepare. We need to become tribulation preppers, spiritual preppers. The number one thing we need to do is to prepare ourselves so we can do exploits just like they do. The number one exploit that's going to happen during the tribulation that we can do and that we will be doing if, you're, if you get on board is winning souls to Jesus Christ. The number one, the number, the absolutely number one exploit 
And I think, and I believe, when God says that we will do exploits during that time, I think that's exactly what he's talking about. He's talking about soul winning. He's talking about opportunities to get people saved. That's the exploits that we'll be doing. That's the exploits that many people will be doing during the tribulation period. Daniel says during that time, they that understand among the people shall instruct many. They that understand among the people shall instruct many. Many, not a few, not a handful, but many will instruct many. I believe many millions of people are going to get saved during the tribulation period. It's going to be the greatest revival that ever existed. It's going to be. People will be scared to death. You think 9-11 was bad? That's nothing like the great tribulation. That's nothing like the tribulation and the great tribulation. This is going to rock people to their core. People will be scared to death of what's going on. They will not know what's going on. They'll be open to just about anything that will explain. Anybody that will explain. Someone to give us an answer. They'll be open to the Antichrist's answer too. And the Bible says that many will believe him. They'll believe a lie. Why? Because they want answers. They're scared. They want these things. Many millions will be saved during that tribulation period because people are going to be scared to death. Antichrist is going to take advantage of it. He's going to do the exploits on his part. You know what? Those people are looking for answers, but you know what? We have the answer. We have it right here. Jesus Christ is the answer. That's the answer. That, you know, this, this, this thing about, you know, oh, we're going we're gonna to save the government through pol politics and, and, and things like that and getting involved with government and voting. Oh, yeah, that sure worked out, didn't it? Okay. Okay, all that stuff is, you know, the, the Brother Howells, the preacher we used to go to church, we used to say the answer is, is not in the White House. It's in the church house. It, the answer lies right here. The answer lies right here. The answer is getting people saved. Soul winning. That's the answer. That's the answer. Now, we need to take full advantage of the troublous times of that tribulation period. Full advantage of it. Don't be left out. Don't be left out. Okay? Get on board now. You can do exploits for God. The tribulation period will be your last chance to win people to Jesus Christ. It'll be your last chance. That's it. That's all there is. Okay? After the rapture, you'll be in heaven. Yeah, you'll get in there. But what are you going to do before that? What are you going to do before that? You know what? If heaven's such a great place, and I, it is, it's fantastic. Jesus is there, amen? So, hey, we're going to go there. If heaven is such a great place, when you got saved, why didn't God take you to heaven right away? Why? He left you here. Why? Well, he's got a job for you. That's why. There's only one reason you didn't go to heaven immediately when it wasn't, Dear Jesus, please save me, and I'm trusting in you to save me, and I believe what you said, please save me. Boom! You get raptured right then and you're in heaven. Is that the way it works? No. You get saved, and then you're left here. Why are you left here? You have a job to do. The job is to witness to other people to get them saved too. You're co-laborers together with Christ. You're ambassadors for Christ. God wants to employ you on the staff. Amen? You, you, God wants to put you on the team. God wants you to be an ambassador. You're the only thing that people are going to be able to see and hear and experience with regard to God. You think, you think people are going to pick up one of these and read it? How many people do you go in their door and they say, I've read the Bible front to cover, you know, and... You know, first off, they don't even pick up a Bible. If they do, it sits on their coffee table as a some sort of, you know, ornament. You know, it's a big family Bible or Catholic Bible, even worse. You know, or it's the wrong Bible. You know, how many people have a King James Bible sitting in their house? Not very many. But you know what? You can get a King James Bible for a buck at the dollar bill store. That's how available they are. God's word is everywhere. Okay. Well, I lost my place. Hold on. So, we need to get on board now. That's my point, okay? You can do exploits. Listen, the tribulation will be your last chance, right? Okay, now wait a second. If you don't start soul winning now, you won't be soul winning then. If you don't start soul winning now, you will not be soul winning during the tribulation period when the opposition is extreme. It's easy to go soul winning now. It's simple. 
Nobody's putting a gun to your head. Nobody's threatening to chop your head off. Nobody's coming into your house and taking the Bibles out of your house. Nobody's doing any persecution to you. Other than, oh, someone told me, you know, to leave their porch. I was persecuted. No, that's not persecution. Wait till the tribulation comes. Then you'll see persecution. Hey, we need to start soul winning now. If you won't soul win now, then you're not going to do it then. There's a limited window of opportunity to get going. There's a limited window. Sometime, here, sometime we're going to run out of time. Sometime we're going to run out of time. The tribulation comes, and then we get raptured, and we're out of time. You won't, you won't be soul winning in the tribulation period if you're too scared to do it now, or if you've put it off too much now and said, you know what, I've got other things to do. I've got things that i got to take care of that are more important than soul winning. Hey, you need to prepare now, not then. You won't prepare then. The time to prepare is now. In any disaster, preparations must always be done prior to the time of trouble. If you wait until trouble comes, you'll be unprepared. It's too late. The people in the hurricane, the time for them to pre prepare down in Florida was not last Friday. It was too late by then. The gas stations were out of gas. The electricity you know, was going to be off pretty soon. Even if they were to try to leave, unless they had prepared with lots of gasoline to get out of Florida. How many hours did it take your parents to get out of Florida? About 12? At least 12 hours where it normally took about maybe a, a two-thirds of that time. It took a long time, and they had trouble finding gas. They weren't prepared. You had, the time to prepare is now, not when the disaster happens. If you want, wait until trouble comes, you'll be unprepared. Ha, now, now, that was all introduction, okay? <laughs> Don't worry. I got four quick points, and we'll be done, all right? Now, the question is, how exactly do we prepare for a great harvest of souls during the tribulation? How do we prepare? What do we do? Let me give you some practical things that will help you prepare for that tribulation period. Number one, okay? Number one, how to four simple steps to help you become a successful soul winner now before it's too late. Now before the tribulation comes and you have to do it under threat of your life. How do you do it? Number one, clean up your act. Pretty simple. Number one, clean up your act, okay? Okay. Um, let's see. I got some props up here. All right. Now, hey, let's see here. Sean, could you come up here for a second? <laughs> All right, Sean. Now, you and I, there's some problems in the basement. Just stand right there. That's good. You're good. Oh, no, come up here. That's good. Even better. Yeah, you're right. There's some problems in the basement with the plumbing, and, you know, we have leakage problems down there. We need to go down there and fix it. You ready? And we need a wrench to do it with, right? Okay, I've got two wrenches. I've got one that's all greasy and dirty and one that's brand new. They're all the same size wrench, okay? And, I'm a, and I want you to choose the wrench you want to use. Go ahead. Duh! Okay? That was my illustration. Thank you, Sean. You're very good. Okay? Guess which one he chose. The dirty, rusty, old one that's got grease all over or the nice, clean one right there? The exact same one. Hey, did you know that I could clean this one up to look just like this and it wouldn't be a problem? And you know what? Sean might have chose that one if this one were cleaned up. You know what? You think God doesn't like to use clean tools? If, you're, if you've got dirt in your life, if you've got grease in your life, if you've got all kinds of scum in your life, and there's somebody else available that doesn't have that, and they're handy also... Guess what? Just like Sean picks the, picked the right one, the clean one, God's going to pick the clean one over the dirty one to use. Okay, we need to clean up our act. How do you do that? Number one, clean up your act. Okay, the Bible says depart from iniquity. How do you do that? Let everyone, in, Timothy, uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, it says, let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Depart from iniquity. Okay, so... Don't sin. As, you know, now, you say, wait a second. We all sin. It's impossible to quit sinning. I know that. Okay? But it says, as a command, depart from iniquity, from evil doing, okay? from bad things, okay? from transgressing the law. Don't do those things. Depart from them. Okay, now wait a second. We said depart from them. But it's not, Paul said it's, you know, it's hard to do that. The things that I want to do, I can't do. The things I can't do, uh, you know. Oh, how's that go again? The things I want to do. 
You know, I'm paraphrasing. This is the Mark Harshman version, okay? You know, the, the things I want to do, I'm not doing. And the things that I don't do, that I do, right? He said that, okay? He had the same problem. The Apostle Paul. Are we any greater than he? No. We have the same problem, the sin problem. As long as you're in the flesh, you got a sin problem. Steve, you and I were discussing a little, I think it was, we were discussing about how nobody told you when you first got saved that you would, you had a, you, the problem you'd run in against, you're still in your body when you're, when you're in sin, right? Or when, you're, uh, when you got saved. You still have the flesh, and you're going to sin. So what do you do? Depart from iniquity. Well, that's, that's tough. That's, that's not easy. You've got to make a conscious decision to try to do that. But wait a second, we're going to fail. We're going to not always depart from iniquity. So realize that when you sin, you, you realize that you're going to fail. Realize that. Don't get down on yourself. Realize it's no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. That's the, that's, the, that's the difference. Don't get down on yourself for sinning. Don't say, I'm not going to go to church because I don't want to be a stupid hypocrite because I sinned last night. Well, welcome to the crowd. We all sinned last night, right? So, hey, realize you're going to fail. You know what? When you do sin, confess your sins to God. That's the answer. That's the answer. Confess your sins to God. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 says, My little children, these things I write unto you, that ye sin not. What's he saying? That ye sin not. You shouldn't sin, right? Don't sin. Wait a second. The second part of that verse, 1 John 2, 1, says, My little children, these things I write unto you that you sin not. And, and, if any man sin, if any man sin, wait a minute, you just told us to not sin. But he's, in the sec, next part of the verse, it says, And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He's assuming that you're going to sin. Okay, don't sin, but if you do, we have an advocate. 1 John 1, 9, very famous verse. You should memorize this one. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, do you believe that or not? Do you believe that or not? Okay, if we confess our sins, when you go, before you go soul winning, do this. Do this. Confess your sins to God. Tell him, I'm a dirty, rotten sinner. Confess every sin you could remember over the last 24 hours or whatever it was, you know, as your last confessed your sins. Try to remember the sins you did and confess them to God. What's that mean? Admit that you did them. That's all it means. God, I went drinking last night and I got drunk. I shouldn't have done that. Not me, I'm just saying. <laughs> but yeah, whatever sin you did, okay? Confess it to God and believe in your heart that what he says is true. He says, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just. Are we? No. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most of it? Some of it? A little bit of it? No. All of unrighteousness. Confess your sins to God. That's the answer. How do you do that first point? How do you do that first point? Clean up your act? Okay. Try your best not to sin, but if you do, confess your sin. That's the second thing. And then the third thing that helps you clean up your act is read your Bible every day. Read your Bible every day doesn't need to be a lot. You don't need to spend five hours a day reading your Bible. Hey, if you can, great. Okay. Most, most people work <laughs> and have a job and have stuff to do at home and have kids and have other responsibilities and things like that. But read your Bible every day. Three cha do you know three chapters a day you can get the whole th a little over three chapters a day you can get through the whole Bible in one year. A new Christian, that's the first thing they should concentrate on getting, getting done, okay? Because if you just read parts of the Bible, you can be fooled easily. You, look at your, you read a part of the Bible only, or a few books only, you're looking at one tree when you should be looking at the whole forest, like we were talking earlier. Remember that? Okay. Look at the whole forest. The only way you can do that is read your Bible. And I'm not talking study your Bible. I'm not saying that. I don't think somebody should, a new Christian shouldn't start studying their Bible until they've read their Bible. You can't study something unless you know all aspects of it, or at least have become familiar with all aspects of it. Some people say you shouldn't even study your Bible until you've read it three times through. Then you can take a small portion, okay, and study that, okay? So, oh man, i got to hurry. Okay, so number one, depart from inequity. You know, clean up your act. Depart from inequity. Confess your sins to God. Read your Bible every day. Psalm 119. Reading God's Word, by the way, helps us, keeps us clean, Okay, wherewithal, Psalm 119, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? 
by taking heed according to thy word. With my whole heart I have sought thee. Let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. The Bible will help you stay clean. So, number one, stay clean. Clean up your act. Depart from iniquity. But when you do, when you, when you, when you do commit iniquity, confess your sins and read your Bible every day. Pretty simple stuff. None of this is stuff that people don't know, but we need to be reminded sometimes. Okay, so number one, the steps to soul winning. Clean up your act. Number two, have a regular time to go soul winning. Have a regular time to go soul winning. Planning and preparing, but planning and preparing is good, but failing to schedule a time to do the actual work that you prepare to do is useless. If I prepare to do something, but then say, when you, well, what are you going to do that thing that you prepared for? Uh, I don't know. Well, when are you going to do it? I don't know. Do you have a time? No. Do you have a place? No. Well, you're not going to do it. Preparing to do the work that you never scheduled the time for is useless. Why did you bother preparing if you're not going to do the work? So have a regular time to go soul winning. Mark 16 and 15. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, right? Go soul winning on a regular basis and be faithful. God is more likely to use you if you are available on a regular basis. He can count on you to show up, and he can count on you to be there when the work needs to get done. Yeah, you know what? As a man, I used to manage a computer program uh, for a computer training program. We used to have several employees. The worst thing, and the worst thing a manager likes is somebody that's not faithful, somebody that doesn't show up, or you can't count on them to show up. They show up some days, not others. That's the worst thing because, you know, I don't care if they have no skills. As long as they're willing to learn new skills, that's fine. But if they don't show up, they can't do anything, all right? So we need to have a regular time to go soul winning and be consistent in doing that. Whether that's on Saturday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I don't care. Have a regular time when you do it, okay? Just, you know, hey, if, if you can't make it on Saturday at 3, you know, Call Pastor Tommy up and say, hey, are there any other times we can go and you'd like to go out with us? Or call me up. You know, I got a job where I can probably, you know, I work at home out of the computer. I can, I can go with you. You know, uh, there's some other people in this church that have more open schedules that, hey, if you can't go on Saturday, you know, what about another day? Does it need to be for a long period of time? No. Hey, if you can only go soul winning for 45 minutes a week, that's better than zero minutes a week, isn't it? Okay. Well, but do it and do it faithfully, right? Count, have God count on you. All right, now, Sean, come on, man, get up here. All right, one last illustration. I got a board with some nails in it, right? Okay, you ready? Now, I'm going to illustrate to you the, the importance of being there and showing up and being available for God to use, right? I'm going to put some tools on here, Sean. And I tested this, this whatever this thing is, this table, and it's pretty strong. I want you to choose one of those tools and pound one of those nails in. Go ahead. Do it. Now, come on. Choose one. Pound one in. Ready? Very good. Now, what is this? Let me tell you. What kind of tool is this? A wrench. Yeah, a pipe wrench, right? It's a small pipe wrench. Is that the proper tool to nail in a nail? No. No, it's not. So we gave him the choice of this rusty old... Uh, uh, What's that called? Chisel. Thank you. What's chisel? Yeah, man. Uh, all right. And we got like a press right in the press and wrench right there. He chose a heavy duty pop thing right here, okay? The pipe wrench. And he knocked it in there. Now, why did he do that? Why did he choose one of those? You know what? Come here, Sean. Over here, we had a hammer. And man, these are my favorite hammers. These are made by Estwing in Rockford. They're nice hammers. I love them. Okay? You know what? This is the proper tool, right? It was sitting over here, hidden from Sean, right? Okay. If I... Sean, do the other ones now. That's the proper tool for doing what he was going to do, right? But why did he use these instead? Someone tell me. They're available. They were sitting right here in front of him, and he didn't have to walk all the way over there, pick up the hammer that was hidden, that was hiding in the corner, scared. Okay? He used what was available in front of him, didn't he? Right? He used what was available. Thank you, Sean. And 
That's what we need to be. We need to be available for God. Okay? I don't care if you're, you, you, you know, you're not a hammer. You're not, you're not one of these bright, shiny hammers made by Estwing and Rockford. I don't care if you're like that. If you've just got enough weight, if enough of you is there to do the job and you're available and you're right where the work needs to get done, God can use you. And God will use you more than he'll use some shiny, nice-looking, dressed right, just perfect, fundamental, independent Baptist guy. Because you were there and they weren't. Okay? Do you have to be going out with a tie and a white shirt and a, and a nice suit and, and nice shiny shoes and all that? Well, hey, that'd be nice, but sometimes I think you're a Je Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon when you do this, when you go out like this. So I don't, I don't wear a tie when I do it because they think I'm a JW. But hey, you know what? God can use you whether you wear a tie or no tie. And God can use you if you let him, if you'll be available. So... Number two, we have to have a regular time. He'll use you if you're available and close by and handy. Simple as that. Okay, so that's the second thing. Third thing. First thing I said was clean up your act. Number two, have a regular time to go sowing. Number three, prepare with supplies. Prepare with supplies. Okay? You know, in war, a, a soldier carries his pack of supplies on his back and also his weapon, right? Okay, a soldier carries those things. Well, hey, what's our weapon? The word of God. Right, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. That's that's our weapons are not carnal; Mighty. they're spiritual. What? Mighty through God. Mighty through God through the pulling down of strongholds. Right now, hey, those weapons are spiritual. You've got to have them. You've got to have supply of them. Physical supply. I'm talking now. Soldiers have physical supplies to get them by, and they have weapons, and they carry their weapon. Soul winners need to have supplies and a weapon. Hey, you need a small Bible when you're out soul winning. Don't carry a big one. Your sword of the Spirit, don't carry a big sword. Okay, here. I'm going to come up to your door, and you're looking out your window at me, and I'm going to come knocking on your door, and I'm going to be carrying one of these. Okay? Now, let me know. Let me know. How many people are going to open the door when I'm standing there like this? I'll give you a hint. None of them will. Don't call 911. All right? You don't go out carrying a big family Bible. Okay? You don't go out with your sword going like this all the time. Okay? Because it scares people. They're not familiar with it. They don't know what your plan is. What in the world is he trying to do? Cut me up? Amen, with the score of the Spirit. That's what we're trying to do. But don't carry a big one. You know what? This one will do the job. It will. The old family Bible, you know, carry it with you. You know, it'll do the job. But it'll scare people. They'll never, they'll, you know, they'll never open up the door. You'll never get a chance. Why? Because they're scared. Here's what you need to do. You need to carry a pocket knife. Got one in here somewhere. There you go. Fits nice in your pocket. You know what? That thing will cut you to threads. That pocket knife right there will do the job that that big knife will do. But it'll do it at the appropriate time, and it'll do it when people, you know, you don't pull out your knife at the very beginning, okay? You be polite. You go to people's door. You say, we're out visiting from First Baptist, or First Baptist, I'm sorry, I'm losing my mind, from Liberty Baptist Church, okay, I'm living in the past again, okay, and we're here to invite you to church, but, and, and you hand them a gospel track and says, that gospel track tells about our church, but more importantly, it tells you how to know for sure you're on your way to heaven, how you can know for sure that you can be on your way to heaven, and what the Bible says about that. Do you know for sure? Do you know for sure you're on your way, that you're on your way to heaven? If you were to die, would you be 100% sure that you'd go to heaven when you were to die? Let me show you. Don't ask them. Don't say, can I show you? Because guess what the answer is going to be. I don't have the time right now. Don't ask them the question. Don't give them an opportunity. Don't plan for failure. Okay? If you say to them, hey, you know, let me show you. Can I show you from the Bible and take about two minutes and show you? 99% of the time, if you say that to somebody and they're not interested, you know, they're just going to say, you know what? I, I don't have the time, but thank you. You know, I'll take and read this. Goodbye. And that's the end of it. Don't give them an opportunity to do that. Don't ask them permission to give the gospel. You already have the permission. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every, cre every creature, the Bible says. It doesn't say 
ask permission to preach the gospel, okay? Say, hey, let me show you what the Bible says. Number one, you need to know you're a sinner. There's none righteous, no, not one, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Number two, sinners deserve to go to hell according to the Bible. If you and I are to pay for our own sins, we're going to suffer in hell forever and ever where there's real fire and real torment. Number three, God loves you, doesn't want you to go to hell. He provided a way out for you. Jesus Christ, the righteous, came down from heaven. God himself, in the form of a man, lived a perfect life, never sinned one time, died on the cross, paid for your sin, my sin, shed his blood for us, died on the cross, they buried him three days later, rose from the dead. That's the third thing you need to know. Fourth thing, what do you need to do? You need to call on the Lord for salvation. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is a gift of God. You need to receive it like a free gift. The way you do that is you ask for it. You ask for the free gift. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Right? That's the basic gospel plan, Romans Road. Okay, you don't take that big sword that I just gave you out right away. Okay? You, you use a small New Testament. We've got some over here. Okay? I mean, hey. Uh, if you need one, look, I, we've got some right here. There's some nice leather ones here, a whole pile of them. If you need one, New Testament right there. You can use these right here. Come up and grab one after the sermon. Free. Don't worry about it. There's some burgundy ones and black ones. Kids, if you need one, there's a smaller one for here in a box. So if you're an adult, grab one of these. If you're a kid, grab one of these. Right there. After service, come and get one. Okay? Use it. Carry a small weapon. Carry a pocket knife, not the big sword. Okay? And have it in your pocket. Don't be carrying it around too much. Don't be waving it you know, around. Have it you know, to your side or down below or in your pocket is even better where it's hidden so they can not be scared Okay, at first. You don't need them to be scared. Just give them the gospel using a small New Testament. Okay. Highlight those Romans words, those Romans road verses in your Bible. Highlight them in your Bible or underline them. Use a marker or a colored pencil. Highlight verses like Romans 10, Romans 3, 13. As it is written, there's none righteous, for all have sinned and destroyed. Highlight those verses. The wages of sin is death. Highlight those verses in Romans. You might want to highlight other ones like Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are you saved through faith that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Or go to famous John 3, 16. For God is the love of the world. Hey, create a map in this little New Testament. Take, this, take one of these little New Testaments. Decide which verses you're going to use to present those four points of salvation. You're a sinner. Sinners deserve to hell, go to hell. Jesus paid the price for your sin and rose again from the dead, and you need to accept it as a free gift. That's the four points right there. Find the verses you want to use. And Romans Road verses, if you need to know what they are, I can show them to you after the service. Underline those things and highlight those things in your New Testament. And then at the, here's what you do. Yeah. Romans 3.20, as it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. At the bottom of the page, write the next verse that you want to go to. Romans, I don't know, 6.23, the wages of sin is death. So you know which verse to go through. You've got a map. Because trust me, when you go to the door, Brother Steve, amen, you, can I get a witness here? When you go to the door, it's easy to get, it's easy to get nervous and distracted. And they'll ask you, well, what about Cain's, you know, they'll answer stupid questions. You know, well, do you guys believe in eternal security? Do you believe, you, you know, okay, focus and keep on task. And the only way you can do that is to, to do an outline and say, that's a good question. Let me, let me call, I might, let's, let's see if we can come back to that. But let me answer some basic questions first and then go through those four points in your New Testament. List the verses and at the bottom, list the next verse. Then you turn to the next verse. Point number two, your sinners deserve to go to hell. Then whatever verse is the next verse, write that at the bottom so you know where to turn to and follow that roadmap, follow that plan in your New Testament, and you won't get off track. Okay? You'll be able to, you know, this is kind of like your outline. This is your roadmap. Don't put your roadmap away. Have it out. Use it. Now, if you, get, if you, if you, if you go through this many times, you don't necessarily need to have this out. If you forget your Bible, if you memorize this all, all these verses, and say, you won't need to use this because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, right? Not by reading, but by hearing. You can do this without doing this. But when you're starting out especially, it's good to have a roadmap, good to have those things written down so you can follow it and stay on track and so you don't get distracted from the gospel plan. You need to do that. Prepare with supplies. Okay. Carry lots of gospel tracts with you also. It's a tool to use as an icebreaker to hand a gospel track to somebody and say, hey, we're out visiting from Liberty Baptist Church, 
And we'd like to invite you to church, like I said. But more importantly, do you know for sure you're on your, heaven, on your way to heaven? It's an icebreaker. Or you can leave it behind if nobody answers the door. Leave it on the door. Don't leave it in the mailbox. That's a crime, they say. But, you know, use that trap. But not as your substitute for witnessing. Not as a substitute for soul winning. Going on a door and putting a door hanger on a door and even putting a tract on a door is not soul winning. You know what that is? It's putting a tract on a door. That's what that is. <laughs> okay? It's not witnessing. You're not verbally giving the gospel to anybody. It helps People can actually get saved as a result of reading a tract, perhaps, okay? But it's your word. Faith cometh by hearing that really does get people saved. God's word has to be heard by them, okay? Now, then, not only with tracts, carry around a little New Testament to give to them once they get saved. Don't get them saved and then say, hey, you're on your own. No, they need a Bible. They need a New Testament. Dollar Bill Store. Here, you can pick up these right here. What was this? was it Dollar Dollar Tree in Dixon? And I think they got some in Sterling and Rock Falls too. I'm not sure. These are a little, little nice. Actually, they're a nice little New Testament, King James Version. Amen. Okay, New Testament. You can hand now. Older people, you might want to get one of the larger ones that have. You know, I can't read this stuff without you know ten magnifying glasses. But for most people that don't have a, a, a view, a, you know, most people that don't have these cheaters. These are good. Hand them out, especially to kids, okay? A dollar a piece. Hand it to them once they get saved. Don't lead them. Don't get them saved. And then let them go on their own. They need a Bible. They need something to read. They need God's Word. That's what they need, okay? So, here we go. Last point. Oh, finally. I'm sorry. I said 8 o'clock. I'm going a little over. I'm sorry. Clean up your act. Point one. Number two, have a regular time to go soul winning. Number three, prepare with these supplies. And most important is point number four. Ask God for the Holy Spirit power, God for his Holy Spirit power, and to help to lead you to the people that he has prepared for you. Ask for the Holy Spirit, an absolute must. If the Holy Spirit doesn't get involved in your soul winning, it's, it's of no use. It's of no use. You can't get people saved. The only thing you can do is preach the gospel to every creature. The only thing you can do is obey the, the command. It's God that gets people saved. It's the Word of God that gets people to have faith. And it's the Holy Spirit that brings the conviction that people need in order to realize they're a sinner and that they need to trust Jesus Christ. It's the Holy Spirit that does it. The Holy Spirit of God. Turn to Luke, one last chap, one last thing. Luke chapter 11. Luke, cha Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11 and verse 9. Luke chapter 11 and verse 9. And he says, And I say unto you, Ask, and it shall be given unto you. Given to you. Seek, and ye shall find. Oh, I can't, I can't, I gotta put my glasses on. Let me try this again. And I say unto you, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh, receiveth. And he that seeketh, findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? If he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask for an egg, will he give him a scorpion? Notice what it says next. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall the, your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Okay, that's a promise of God. Ask God for the power of the Holy Spirit. You already have the Spirit of God living inside of you if you're born again. You already have that. But you know what? You need God's power to do God's work. Okay, the Holy Spirit is the one that does the work in convicting people. Ask Him. He says, seek and you shall find. Ask and it shall be given unto you. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? You got to ask. You got to ask. Ask him also for the Holy Spirit. Ask the Holy Spirit to lead you to the person whom God has prepared for you. Ephesians 2 8 and 9 is a very famous verse we often quote during soul winning for uh, by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But we forget the last part of that. The last, the next verse, verse 10. 
In verse 10, in, for by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves to give to God, not of works that any man should boast. And verse 10 says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. God has prepared works for us to do. He's pre he has prepared and ordained works for us to do that we should walk in them. He's done the preparing. Remember, we're talking about being a tribulation prepper? Okay. Now, God's prepared some people for you when you go out soul winning. Ask him to lead you to those people. God has before ordained those good works, the soul winning works, those good works for us. You know what I call those? Divine appointments. I talked to you about that, Steve. Divine appointments. You know, These are divine appointments that God has for you. You know what? You need to show up for a doctor's appointment, don't you? It's a time and a place. It's a prepared place. It's a prepared, it's a predetermined time. You got to show up. God has those same things. God has appointments for you as a soul winner. There are divine appointments that God would like us to keep. People who have been seeking after God. Or people whom God has prepared and are waiting for a soul winner to come by their house and tell them about Jesus. They're waiting. They're out there. They are waiting for somebody to tell them about Jesus. That's all they need. Hey, there's a couple of examples real quick uh, in closing. Renee Menas and I were out soul winning here right in this uh, pro housing project back here. And after we got done soul winning, we thought nobody would get saved. And then at the very last, a, a, a young lady named Chelsea was with her daughter going into her car. And I said, hey, this is an opportunity. And so I felt like, okay, God, we asked you to lead us to people. Maybe this is the one. Went and talked to Chelsea. She was about, I don't know, 23 or so, young mother. And we witnessed to her, went through the whole plan of salvation. She listened intently. And she, we got to the part where she was going to get saved, and she did get saved. She trusted Jesus Christ as her Savior. Just open as all get out. Unbelievable. And after that happened, after she trusted Christ and on her way to heaven, you know what she said? She said, you know, this is just so bizarre. This is so weird. I go, what do you mean? She goes, I just got back from my grandfather's funeral. And, you know, I was, I was sitting there praying and asking God to show me about heaven. Show me, show me, you know, is my grandfather in heaven? How does a person get to heaven? She said, I was just thinking about these very things just an hour or two ago at my grandfather's funeral. Okay? That was a divine appointment, I'm telling you. God wanted that person to be visited by a soul winner. She was prepared. She was ready. She was wanting to know how to get to heaven. God had prepared her. And you have to come together with the person that needs to get saved. And you know what? Here's the soul winner coming along. And you know what? You can't always see each other. But God's up here, right? God can see both of you, and God can put you together. Okay, but if you don't show up, you can't. That can't happen. Chelsea got saved as a result of a as a result of a divine appointment. Another one, Michael. Okay, Pastor Tommy and I were out. I think this was in Sterling, but there was a guy named Michael that we went and visited. He was working on his truck outside, and he was on house arrest. Um, he had done some pretty bad things, and he was sentenced to house arrest. He had one of those ankle bracelets on, you know, where they put you on where you can't, if you go outside a certain boundary or, or leave your property, something alarm goes off, whether it's GPS or whatever, I don't know how they do it. But he was wearing one of those. He had done some pretty wicked things and he'd been in and out of the correctional facilities all his life. And, and, and he's just sick and tired of all the stuff that's you know, that he went through and had to go through. Well, we witnessed to him. He was just open as can be. And here's a guy, a criminal, a convicted criminal. And he had gone through some bad things, all right? He was looking for some answers. And he got saved also. Pastor Tommy and I led him to the Lord, okay? And you know what? That was a divine appointment. He said, this is weird. He didn't use that word. I think he was a stranger, odd, or something like that. He goes, because I was just thinking, I've been through all this stuff, and here I am, I can't even leave my own property. I can't even go anywhere I want. I'm, I'm a prisoner. I can't, I'm tired of living this way. I, I need God. I need God to do something for me. I can't straighten out myself. I've tried. I've been in and out. I need some answers. It's funny that you guys came today. Funny. Funny. No, it was a divine appointment. It wasn't funny at all. It was a divine appointment. But if we didn't go, he wouldn't have got saved. Another one, the last illustration I'll give you of a divine appointment was in Lanark, Illinois. Okay? Um, 
we, a group of us went up to Lanark to go soul winning, and uh, we were following Pastor Tommy in the car. Uh, Sean, you, you, three, you three were there, okay? And we went to a, a, a street where Pastor Tommy stopped, and he said, okay, we're going to divide up, and you take this street, you take that street. He said, Mark, you and, you and uh, Steve, you take this street, and the boys will take the other side of the street if you want. And I said, right here, this street here, okay? We didn't ask him which street to choose. Pastor Tommy was relying on the Holy Spirit, obviously. He said, you take that street. Okay, okay. So then I said to Steve, okay, Steve, I'll tell you what, we'll take the left side. The boys, uh, I don't know if it was Kyle, and I, don't, I can't remember if it was Pastor Tommy's kids I, who took the, that side of the street or not. But in any case, they took that side of the street, and we took the left side of the street. And I said, first house we came to, right on the corner. Guess what? Steve goes, huh. I go, what? This is the house where Lori and I used to live. I said, really? Now, in that house, did you guys get saved in that house? You, Steve got saved at that house. And did you, Sean, too? I don't know if you got saved in that house. But that's the very house they used to live in, and he got saved in. And we're talking about a house that, you know, did we, did, did we plan to go to that house? <laughs> did Pastor Tommy know that you lived at that house? No. Did I know that you lived at that house? Pastor Tommy said, go to that street. Did he know that house? No. Did I know that house? And I said, hey, Steve, we'll take this side. The kids will take that side. And Steve's like, okay. And then, then after we walked up to the house, he's like, well, this is the house we used to live in. This is the house I got saved in. Okay, that's odd. That's odd that we would be led to that house. Okay, well, we went to the, we went to the front porch, and we talked to Janelle, the wife. And she listened intently. She had a bunch of kids with her, three kids they had. And she listened to the gospel, and she got saved. Amen? Amen. She got saved. And Steve told her, hey, this is the house that I got saved in. Okay, this is the house that I got saved in. That was odd. That was funny. No, I think that was a divine appointment. It gets better. Steve and I went down the other street. A couple other people got saved. Sean joined us up with us at that time, and we went, witnessed to a couple more people. Then we were walking back. It was the end of the time to go soul winning. We were walking back towards that street where about where the house was that we that he got saved that they used to live in. And Steve says, "Hey." There's a guy in the backyard working that was probably her husband. And, I, and he goes, maybe we ought to go witness to her. And I said, oh, I don't know. It's time to go, you know. And, and he said something like, what, are you chicken? <laughs> I'm like, okay. <laughs> so I'm glad. You know what? God led him to say that. Or something. I don't know what you said. Were you chicken or you're scared or something? I don't know what he said. Something like that. And you know what? I said, no. Okay, we're going to go talk to the guy. Just because of you, Steve. Okay, time to go, but no, we got to go witness to this guy because Steve says so. Okay, no, just kidding. And we went and witnessed to the, the, the guy that was working. He, he was working in the backyard or on the side yard there, and his name was Ryan. And that was the wife, it was a husband of Janelle who just got saved a few minutes before or maybe an hour before. And he, we witnessed to him. Sean, you were there. You, you helped a little bit, and, and, and Steve also. And he went through the whole plan of salvation, listened intently, answered yes, sir, no, sir, an unsaved person, using answers like that. You know, and just you could tell the guy had character just by talking to him, and even as an unsaved person. And he listened to the whole gospel and he got saved. Amen. And you know what? Afterwards, he said something to the effect of, you know what, I'm, I'm sorry to take up so much of your time, I said to him. And he said, he said, hey, you can take up my time like this anytime, anytime you want to come. This is awesome. This is great. You know what? He was thankful that we came there. You, you say, that was odd. That was weird. That These two couple, this couple got saved in the same house that Steve got saved in, the same house that Lori was living in, and Sean was there too. I think you lived there for a while, didn't you? As a small kid. I don't know if it's that house or the other one. But in any case, that was odd. That was strange that you would go to that house and those people would get saved. No, that was a divine appointment. You think it's by chance that those people lived in the exact same house that Stephen Morey lived in? I don't think so. Do you think it's chance that Pastor Tommy said, hey, you guys go to that street? Do you think it was chance that once we got on that street, I said, not knowing, Steve, let's take the left side and the kids will take the right. Do you think that was chance too? Do you think the, chan the, 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 the chances that both of them were home and open to the gospel and ready, willing, and able to get saved, that was just by chance? That was a divine appointment. That was a divine appointment. Okay. Now, just in summary, clean up your act. 
have a regular time to go soul winning, prepare with supplies, and ask the Holy Spirit to help you. Hey, you can do this. You can do this. You can do this. It's not that hard. It really isn't. It, you know, go out with a, and be a silent partner and watch somebody else do it for a while. Do it, do it, do it. Okay? Hey, all you have to do is be faithful. Be like that tool right there. You don't have to be, you don't have to be pretty. You don't have to be the right tool. You don't have to be the polished tool. You don't have to be the perfect tool that says the perfect words and dress perfectly and act perfectly. No, you just have to be willing to be there and do what God commanded you to do. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's what God said. Okay? That's all you need to do. Do those four things, and God will help you to become a tribulation prepper. But you got to do it now before the tribulation period starts. Because once the trouble comes, you'll be too tempted and too scared, and you'll hide in your little hole. You'll hide like that hammer was hiding back here. Didn't want anybody to use it because you were too scared. Don't be like the hammer. Be like these tools up here that weren't like the hammer. They weren't the right tool, but they were ready, willing, and able to be used, and they were there. Then you'll be prepared to go soul winning and do soul winning exploits. Exploits. Don't let the Antichrist be the only one that gets those exploits. You be some. You, be, you get some of those exploits. You get some of those souls saved. Not that you're doing it, but God's doing it. But you be the tool that God uses to do exploits. Do it now, and you'll be prepared to be a tribulation prepper, and do it then too. Let's pray for a minute. Dear God, thank you for giving your word. I pray that you would help us to do your work and to Lead us to the people that need to be saved. Help us to clean up our act, have a regular time to go soul winning, and uh, carry the proper supplies, and ask your Holy Spirit to lead us to the people that need to get saved. Please help us now in Jesus' name.